Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today for Hunt and Williams webinar discussing the GDR, GDPR breach uh, notification provisions. Uh, we are delighted to host this webinar, webinar with uh, Deloitte. Uh, as many of you know, I'm Lisa Soto. I head uh, Hunt and Williams' top-ranked global privacy and cybersecurity practice, and I also serve as chair of the Department of Homeland Security's Data Privacy and Integrity Advisory Committee. Uh, before we begin, please note that our program is being recorded, and we will provide everyone with a link uh, to listen to the recording at a later date. If you have any questions throughout the program, please use the chat feature on your screen, and you can type in questions. Uh, if time permits, we will address questions at the end of our program. The GDPR represents the biggest single change in my mind on uh, the global privacy landscape. Um, I think during, during my working career, it really represents a, a seismic uh, shift because so many other nations outside the, the EU have adopted the EU data protection regime and will undoubtedly over the next uh, few years and decade adopt the general data protection regulation uh, concepts as well. Um, there's no question that complying with the GDPR is, is tying even the most sophisticated companies up in knots. And uh, we were given two years to comply. That um, is, is proving to be really necessary. And, of course, many companies are starting um, now, and that's okay, too, to just uh, press ahead as soon as possible to uh, get to compliance or a reasonable state of compliance by the May 25, 2018 deadline. Our goal today is to give you a brief overview of some of the uh, key issues associated with the GDPR uh, with a focus on the breach notification provisions. The, the privacy team at Hunton & Williams, just to give, us a give you a sense of our perspective at Hunton, uh, we represent clients across industry sector. Uh, in, in the technology sector, financial services, healthcare, um, uh, retail, and, and many others. Uh, we also have associated with the firm our Center for Information Policy Leadership, uh, which is a privacy think tank. And if you're very focused on this area, I would commend you to our blog at www.huntonprivacyblog.com. Uh, and we have a Twitter handle, uh, Hunton underscore privacy. Um, um, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's program. Uh, my partner, Aaron Simpson, who is resident in uh, Hunton & Williams London uh, London office, leads the firm's European data protection uh, practice. He has spent 15 years uh, advising clients on a broad range of complex privacy, data protection, and cybersecurity matters, uh, and he is well known as a, as a top privacy professional. Uh, Aaron has been recognized by Chambers and Partners, by Computer World, by New York Super Lawyers, uh, and by the Legal 500, and I'll, I'll stop there. Um, he has many accolades. Uh, we're also joined and, and truly delighted to have with us Nicole Davenport. Uh, Nicole is a senior manager in Deloitte's, in Deloitte's uh, cyber risk services practice. She focuses on cyber strategy and privacy matters. Uh, Nicole handles cyber incident assessments, plans, and response, uh, as well as privacy assessments and guidance, and frequently incorporates cross-border and GDPR-related issues into her uh, matters. She has more than 15 years of experience leading teams on complex projects and providing analysis and strategy recommendations uh, to clients. Um, we will be uh, providing, I'm, I'm, if we have the slides up yet, uh, I'm going to the roadmap. Um, we'll be providing, as I said, an overview of the current cyber landscape. Nicole will, uh, will assist us there. And then Aaron will uh, give us a, an overview of the GDPR generally. Uh, I will talk a little bit about breach notification requirements under the GDPR. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, GDPR preparation, how to, uh, how to move ahead uh, with this, this very difficult compliance burden. And then we'll, uh, we'll see if we have questions, uh, if we have time for questions, which we are delighted to take. Uh, over to you, Nicole. Great, thanks. So this is Nicole Davenport, and as Lisa said, I'm a senior manager in Atlanta uh, from the Deloitte office there focusing on privacy matters. And I'd like to thank everybody for participating today because really this is a great time to address not only the GDPR, uh, but also just the ever-changing landscape that we have with respect to cyber threats and cyber threats. 
strategy. What we see is a triple threat, a triple threat uh, with a changing environment, and that is a changing threat environment. The cyber criminals are getting smarter. They're trying to come up with more sophisticated ways to attack everybody, which we see in the news every day. There's a changing IT environment. Uh, business models are evolving. Everybody spent a number of years tooling all of their systems to have backups, and now all of a sudden with ransomware, the backups don't necessarily do what we had hoped, so our IT environments are changing. And then, of course, there is the changing regulatory environment. As Lisa mentioned, right now we've got the GDPR. It's likely within the next decade we will see a, a worldwide version of the GDPR. So companies are facing more demanding cybersecurity regulations, steeper penalties, and so compliance at this point becomes essential. I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to, uh, to talk to everybody about the GDPR basics. Thanks, Nicole, and thanks, everyone, for your time. So just before we get into the breach response and breach notification requirements of the GDPR, we want to sort of make sure everybody's on the same page with respect to the GDPR. And, and first and foremost, what does GDPR mean? It means the General Data Protection Regulation. And that R there in that, in that um, definition is meaningful. Regulation in European law means it applies it starts from Brussels and it applies across the 28 EU member states generally. Um, that's very different from the current law, which is a directive, which essentially sets the floor and the member states then implement their own version. So what we have um, in substantial measure is, is a much more comprehensive law, um, although not universally comprehensive as we'll, as we'll get to. The law will apply across the EU starting on May 25th of next year. Um, so now we're sort of closing in on the last I guess six months or so um, for, for companies just to, to get ready. So a lot of them are quite, quite hot and heavy right now in their compliance readiness um, programs. The law impacts all companies that have an establishment in the EU um, or, and this is an innovation of the GDPR, those outside the EU that are offering goods or services to individuals in the EU or monitoring the behavior of individuals in the EU. These are the so-called targeting provisions of Article 3.2 of the GDPR, um, which are really intended to reflect sort of modern computing and modern technology and the ability for companies to process data meaningfully about Europeans despite the fact that they never set foot physically in the EU. And that has actually opened up a whole new um, world with respect to regulatory compliance in the EU because obviously um, there are a number of business, business models and use cases that involve uh, extraterritorial processing of, of European data in 2017. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the GDPR <coughs> imposes um, a number of new obligations. It also imposes a number of enhanced obligations over existing law. Some of the new obligations here we've listed in the slides around privacy notices, in their content, uh, breach notification, which we'll get to, data subject rights. You know, there's always been access rights, but now there's sort of access rights on steroids, if you will, um, with portability. Um, there's rights to erasure, a um, number of others as well. Um, conducting privacy impact assessments is no longer, you know, just a best practice. It's now a requirement of law, and in many cases, so is appointing a data protection officer. So there's a number of new obligations. Um, and, you know, there's some teeth to the, to the regulation uh, in the form of potentially heavy fines for non-compliance. So we see in the, in the slide here up to 20 million euros or 4% of global revenues, which is obviously, you know, quite a startling number when you think about it, um, and it sort of remains to be seen exactly how those fines will be divvied out. Um, you know, but certainly, you know, that, that has most people's attention in, in terms of making sure that they think through exactly what their approach will be when it comes to compliance with the GDPR. Uh, if the slides are up, we can go to the next slide um, around the scope of European data protection law. I think this is a really, really important concept. Um, the existing law only applies to data controllers, right, or the, the entities who determine the purposes and the means of the processing. Um, the scope of the GDPR has, has been extended to cover both controllers and processors, and processors who are the entities who follow the instructions of the controllers but really can't do anything else with the data. They never had to worry about direct legal compliance. They always had to worry about contractual compliance but not direct legal compliance. That has changed under the GDPR. There are now a number of provisions that apply directly to processors. That's important. 
Uh, in terms of territorial scope, we just talked a little bit about this. Um, the directive applies to controllers that are established in the EU, uh, you know, physical presence, uh, in local incorporated subsidiary, branch office, or some other permanent presence, um, but, but also applies to companies not established in the EU. Um, the old law was applicable also to companies not established in the EU, but the test was known as the equipment test, and so it only applied to companies outside the EU to the extent they used equipment located in the EU, such as through cookies, um, et cetera. Um, that's not the test anymore. We talked a little bit about these targeting provisions. It, it applies now not where equipment is used, but instead if a company supplies goods or services to EU data subjects or if they monitor EU data subjects. So less focused on the equipment, more focused on the outcome. So things like behavioral advertising um, and other business use cases, uh, if you're involved in those and not, don't have bricks and mortar in the EU, you're still going to be subject to European law despite the lack of a physical establishment. Um, for U.S. companies, you know, this means that a company that's selling goods to Europeans online without a presence in Europe, which is increasingly easy to do through technology, will now be subject to the GDPR, and that's a very significant change. So just so that everyone's on the same page or on the key concepts in data protection law in Europe, we've listed them in the slides here. Um, this just at a high level important to understand that personal data, unlike in the U.S., personal data is a, is a defined term. Uh, it's a comprehensive term. There's not 10 different definitions of personal data in the EU. There's one definition um, in the EU, um, and it's a very, very, very wide-ranging definition and includes any information potentially that directly or indirectly identifies individuals. It even includes some things that don't arguably identify individuals. Um, in some cases, things like IP addresses and other online identifiers could be considered IP addresses, and, and that was included in the GDPR. It was also the subject of a very, so that's something that also you need to be thinking about that is subject to regulation. Sensitive personal data is a subcategory of personal data um, that essentially requires, uh, criminal offenses is actually a subcategory of sensitive data now under the GDPR, and it kind of has its own treatment. But essentially, um, when, you're, when, when sensitive data is involved, there's going to be the need for a heightened legal basis in order to process that data, typically in the form of consent. Processing, this is, this is sort of the linchpin that brings it all together in the, in the GDPR. This is essentially the act of using personal data. Um, it includes all the verbs you can possibly think of, storing data, accessing data, editing data, updating, archiving, simply viewing the data. Um, you know, the GDPR essentially applies to companies that are within scope, you know, in the context of what we talked about with the establishment and that process personal data. So processing is a key verb, and the takeaway is that it's almost anything that you do with data. Um, there's a lot of companies that come to us and say, but we only do this. We only view it. We only access it. We don't do this. We don't do that. Is that processing? And the answer is almost always yes. Uh, data controller we talked about, and data processor we talked about. So I hopefully we're clear on those. Next slide. Um, this one I think is a really good slide, and, and, and hopefully you'll be able to print the slide page. Right? What is the GDPR about at the highest level? It's about harmonization. We talked a little bit about that, you know, in terms of the law applying more uniformly across the member states. It's about increased obligation. It's about the strengthened rights of individuals in the form of um, data access and portability and um, the various various rights that individuals have, and it's about increased fines, uh, enforcement, liability. So if your management team were trying to understand what the GDPR is about and they don't have, you know, more than five or ten minutes to understand it, to me this is the slide um, that, that you use because at a high level this is really what it's about. The harmonization piece is important. Obviously, harmonized rules, but also harmonized jurisdiction. There's the opportunity for a one-stop shop. There's opportunity for a lead data protection authority so that you're not dealing with, you know, 25 member state regulators um, if you are operating across that many jurisdictions. Um, there's some reduction of administrative burden. Um, so, so there's har harmonization is a good, good aspect, I think, a positive aspect of the GDPR. Increased obligations. Um, obviously, the, the data protection principles of, of consent and transparency have been tightened. Um, rules around privacy impact assessments, privacy by design, breach notification, you know, the direct obligations um, you know, that are imposed on processors and the liability that can be imposed on processors, 
you know, the very a various aspects of accountability that need to be implemented as part of the GDPR, your need to, 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 to create and, and review and maintain inventories of your data processing and your need to appoint a data protection officer. These are all examples of the increased obligations of the GDPR. We've talked about the strength and rights of the individuals. Uh, and we've talked about the fines. There's also possibilities for individual actions, for compensation. There's even provisions that arguably will permit class actions, and there's some action in this regard with respect to Max Schrems in Europe in the last week or so has, has created a nonprofit organization that was intended to bring these types of actions regularly under the GDPR. Um, there's the possibility of criminal sanctions under member state law. Uh, and there's this new European Data Protection Board made up of the member state regulators um, who will also be involved in the enforcement process when necessary. Next slide is around the fines and sanctions. We talked about the 20 million euros, the 4% total worldwide turnover. You know, the fines are supposed to take into account the gravity and the duration of the violation. We are not anticipating 20 million euro fines because you get a few words incorrect in your privacy notice. Um, this is more, you know, we, we would expect the most serious fines to reflect the most serious offenses or even multiple offenses or violations of orders, you know, things of that magnitude. But certainly the fining capability is there, um, and it remains to be seen exactly how this will play out. Like I said, criminal sanctions are available, and they'll be continued to be um, determined at the national uh, member state level. Um, in the UK, for example, where, where I live, if an offense is committed by a company, with, with the, con the consent or connivance of or attributable to neglect of a director, the director and company are guilty of an offense. Offenders are liable to be proceeded against and punished accordingly. So there's the possibility of director liability under the UK law. That is not new. Uh, that is a continuation of, of existing law, and obviously that has not been something that the enforcement authorities have sought to use very often um, under, under UK law. Moving on to the, to the next slide. Um, we've talked about this one around the application of the law to EU businesses and then also to non-EU businesses. And so this slide goes into sort of a, a more detailed um, exegesis on what is targeting, what is, mark, uh, what is monitoring, um, you know, and these are questions that come up for us all the time with our clients who are interested in understanding how the GDPR might impact their business. Um, and so these are things that certainly um, you know, we can talk more about. The, the lesson here is simply, if you're outside the EU but you're doing business in the EU, look out. You make sure that you understand exactly what the scope of that business is and the scope of your potential obligations, and, and certainly we'd be glad to, to help you with those, those issues. Okay, moving on <coughs> to security. Security is a very important part of the GDPR, and obviously security has been a very important part of all of your businesses now for many, many years. And in the legal world, you know, the intersection between security and the law came about primarily in the U.S., you know, starting with California's data breach notification laws, where security, often to the chagrin of our IS colleagues, you know, started to take on a real, you know, sort of legal component. And that certainly is the case with the GDPR, where security um, is, is formally uh, re required um, as a component, important component of the GDPR. So this slide here on risk assessment and safeguards, um, you know, essentially no processing of personal data is without risk, um, and this is recognized by the drafters of the GDPR. Um, but the GDPR does require that companies address the risk by applying appropriate safeguards to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. Okay, so if you look at Article 32 of the GDPR, there's a number of specific security measures that are listed as suggestions for companies to consider when they're developing their safeguards. And these include things like encryption and pseudonymization, which is something less than encryption, um, which is when you replace names with unique numbers, but you keep the identifiable information separately so they're still linkable, so it's not fully encrypted, um, but it's pseudonymized, um, as well as process for regular testing, assessing and evaluating the effectiveness of your technical and organizational measures for ensuring the security of the processing. So these are examples of things that the regulators think that you should be thinking about with respect to your data. But you, you only have to do this as appropriate, which I think is important because the last thing we need is super prescriptive security regulations that are out of date you know, six months from now. Um, in determining the appropriate safeguards and procedures, the controller needs to take into account the state of the art. In other words, what technology is currently available and what's the cost 
of implementation of such technical and other measures. Um, at this point, it's not really clear whether the size and resources available to a company will be a relevant consideration in determining whether costs of the art costs um, should whether state of the art technology should be employed. I think it's a fair guess that if you're a massive organization, uh, you're going to be held to a higher standard with respect to the general sophistication level of the technology that you employ. Um, I, that hasn't been made clear, but I think it's fairly clear that that is what is expected. Um, you know, companies are going to need to ensure that their safeguards include technical, organizational, and administrative safeguards. You know, technical safeguards are things like firewalls and passwords and encryption, and organizational safeguards involve ensuring appropriate access to your facilities and to places within your facilities where data is stored, and administrative safeguards are the policies, the procedures in place to facilitate protection of the data. The security requirements themselves are largely the same as those that exist under the directive, but they take on a newfound importance as a result of the breach notification requirements of the GDPR, which Lisa is going to discuss shortly. Um, keep in mind that although a data breach may be reportable under the GDPR, it is not in and, in and of itself a violation of the GDPR. A data breach is not necessarily a violation of the GDPR. That being said, the supervisory authorities are certainly going to explore your compliance with these affirmative data security obligations that I've been talking about in the wake of a breach. And thus, it's really important that you both have the appropriate safeguards in place as well as the ability to communicate those safeguards to regulators, which requires that the safeguards have been developed in a thoughtful manner and in writing. At the end of the day, this is a lot of what the GDPR brings to the security table, which is making sure your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, which I think is a useful exercise regardless of where you operate. With that, I'll turn it over to Lisa. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so uh, let's turn to uh, the date, first data breach notification slide. Um, for the first time across Europe, the GDPR introduces a comprehensive breach notification requirement that applies to all of the uh, EU member states. Just to provide a, a bit of background on uh, data breach notification in the EU, um, currently there are two EU directives in place that uh, address breach notification. Uh, one of them is the e-privacy directive, and it applies to telecoms and ISPs. Uh, and for those entities, uh, there is a requirement to notify DPAs and also individuals if a, a breach will adversely affect their personal data. Second, there is the NIS directive, Network and Information Services Directive. Uh, this applies to operators of essential services and to digital uh, service providers. And there is an obligation under the NIS directive uh, to report uh, issues that will have a substantial impact on operations, substantial uh, disruption um, effect. And then separately, there are breach laws, uh, breach notification laws in a number of, of member states, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, in Germany, uh, in Ireland, uh, in Norway, and then there are um, recommendations, strong recommendations in other countries as well, like in, in France and the UK. So that's what is in place right now. Um, as, as I said, there are going to be very significant uh, shifts in this arena coming with the GDPR, so we will have for the first time an EU-wide uh, notification obligation that will hit uh, uh, every member state um, and will apply regardless of industry sector. Uh, personal data breach uh, uh, notifications will need to be uh, sent out to already the government agency uh, no later than 72 hours after becoming aware uh, of the breach, um, which is an exceptionally aggressive um, time period uh, that we're, we are, by the way, seeing um, mimicked now in other places like in the Philippines, um, in New York State, the uh, newish uh, Department of Financial Services regulations have uh, now integrated a 72-hour notice requirement as well. So this is not, um, not going to be a one-shot deal in Europe. Uh, you need to report to the supervisory authority uh, within 72 hours of having become aware of a breach unless the breach is unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. So there is a harm thre threshold of sorts uh, built in. 
Um, the real question, of course, is when does a company become aware of a data breach? Uh, and is, is the issue uh, that arises likely to result in uh, a risk to the rights and freedoms uh, of natural persons? Um, the, the risk threshold here, the harm threshold, is really quite low. Um, and given the ex exceptional penalties that uh, attach to noncompliance, we expect that most companies are going to be reasonably conservative in, uh, in interpreting this, this harm threshold. Uh, you don't only need to, to uh, notify the DPAs, you also need to notify individuals. But I, I just want to point out the difference here between um, EU law and US law, where the focus is on affected individuals in the EU, the immediate focus, at least, is on uh, the, the government agency. So uh, in, uh, under the GDPR, you will need to notify individuals without undue delay. That's the, uh, the, the, the statement uh, in the GDPR. Um, when the breach is likely to result in, in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of, of individuals. Um, so again, this is really a sea change in Europe, um, and it is likely to result in the um, parade of horribles that we've witnessed in the U.S. resulting from at least some breach events. Uh, and this will, of course, mean uh, retaining forensic investigators, outside counsel, PR firms, setting up call centers, uh, figuring out what uh, identity protection services are available, available in Europe, and they're different from what's available here. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the day, resolving um, the myriad business and regulatory disputes that will, uh, will inevitably follow. Um, and we are a bit fearful of uh, the possibility of class action lawsuits in Europe the way uh, we have seen here. Let's move on to the slide, cost of a data breach, please. Um, breaches of course, we know results in very, very significant uh, expenses to the organization. And just to, to quickly go over what we uh, are foreseeing uh, and, and, of course, have experienced here in the States, um, we see very significant notification-related costs, the cost of outside counsel, the cost of forensic investigators, call center, uh, identity protection uh, service, external PR firm, et cetera. Um, so those are direct uh, hits to an organization that suffers a breach. Um, we also, of course, see very significant damage to a company's reputation uh, and uh, also client and service provider relationships uh, to the extent an entity has suffered a compromise. We're now going to uh, see under the GDPR the potential for regulatory fines at a very significant level. Um, the, uh, the breach provision uh, could result, violation of the breach provision could result in a fine of up to 10 uh, million euros or 2% of global turnover. And you can bet that if you have an egregious breach that gets you to that 2% uh, level or, or uh, is alleged to be egregious enough to hit that level, um, the DPAs are going to find myriad other uh, issues and uh, they will likely be thinking about 4% and not 2%. Um, also under the G GDPR, um, there is a possibility for compensation claims. Um, we have, of course, seen uh, the results of class action lawsuits in the United States, and there is a uh, sort of rising tide of class action possibility uh, in Europe as well, particularly in the UK and, and Germany. So uh, we are uh, we're looking out for that. Um, defending litigation and dealing with regulatory enforcement um, results in big costs. These are, these are very enormous, uh, really, really enormous uh, um, uh, expenses that companies face. Uh, just to give you some numbers, TJX uh, spent $256 million, uh, Target $162. Um, we know that with respect to Sony, um, the, uh, it was close to an existential threat for the company. And of course, um, not on this slide, but uh, everybody's thinking about Equifax and now Uber. Next slide, please. Um, the the 72-hour requirement really is difficult. Uh, anybody who has handled the breach knows that this is it's it's just not it's it, it's not possible to have any sense really of what's going on um, within 72 hours and. Um, you don't 
just need to notify the supervisory authority that there's an issue. You need to notify them of a whole uh, host of, uh, of, of items that are listed in the GDPR that they are going to want to be notified about, like what data, what individuals were impacted, what remedial actions have you put in place. So this is, of course, really impossible to do without, within a 72-hour period. Uh, but one thing is absolutely clear, and that is that you need to plan uh, in advance to make such a notification within 72 hours. So um, you know, very important to think about compliance at a global level when you're dealing um, with a data breach. Most data breaches these days of any size are absolutely global. Uh, and so we're dealing with U.S. laws, Canadian obligations, uh, European obligations, obligations in Asia, obligations, notification obligations in Latin America as well. Uh, so the EU is not, not the only one. Uh, and of course, we need to understand our data uh, and assess the status of, of protections and um, deal with vendor management issues as well. Um, I'll just, let me just uh, backtrack a little bit. I think the, um, the issue of uh, the 72-hour issue and the, the becoming aware language in the GDPR is going to be really critical when considering timing issues. And this really just underscores the need to have um, airtight incident response plans in place so that uh, breach events are escalated quickly to the right people who can manage these events. Um, and as a practical matter, this means that uh, most companies will be in the unenviable position of having to notify a regulator when they know very little about an event. Uh, but to even do that successfully requires uh, substantial advanced preparation. And that means, you know, again, having an incident response plan in place that builds in this 72-hour notice requirement, uh, making sure you're doing tabletop exercises because uh, you need to practice. And the one thing that we can promise you in this, in this space is that preparation mitigates harm. So practicing in a tabletop exercise is really, really key. Uh, make sure you have a data breach notification, uh, a data breach notification toolkit at the ready, uh, and think also about cyber insurance. This is a brand new market uh, in the EU. It's a, a, a much more mature uh, market, not fully mature, but more mature market in the United States. But um, it is it is a good backstop um, in Europe to consider. So preparation is key. Uh, next slide, please. Vendor management. Um, Article 28 of the GDPR imposes obligations on, uh, on controllers um, to uh, make sure that you're retaining data processors, service providers, um, who can uh, protect your data in the way that you expect. The Article 28 provisions are the equivalent of Article 17 in the directive, um, but it's sort of Article 17 on steroids. Uh, and if you recall, Article 17 required only that uh, the data processor abide by the instructions of the controller and also apply appropriate uh, security safeguards to protect the data. Um, now, Article 28 uh, contains a list of obligations that are going to have to be imposed by contract on uh, data processors. Uh, and they include things like not um, allowing any subprocessing without the consent of the controller. Um, there is no model form at this time that um, contains the Article 28 provisions. Hopefully, uh, we will we'll get one at some point. But this is going to be a, a hard row to hoe um, to get these all in place by May 25th. Uh, you may have 20. Uh, data processors who, who uh, have access to European data, or you may have, uh, in the case of one of our clients, 20,000. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to make sure that you get these in place by uh, the compliance deadline. Very important to inventory um, your uh, data processors, make sure you know who they are, and send them the agreement uh, for them to sign, and of course the negotiation period may take a little while as well. So uh, this, this may uh, take some time to, uh, to iron out, so start sooner rather than later. Let's move to uh, liability considerations. Uh, so look, Article 28 is one, one thing, and that it's, it's uh, necessary to have these provisions built into uh, contracts. 
But there are other provisions that also need to be built in that are not um, enumerated in Article 28, like uh, ensuring that you are getting notified of breaches by, uh, by your data processors. Uh, these provisions, these breach notification provis provisions, should include uh, requirements uh, where a data processor is responsible for a breach to, uh, to pay uh, for the direct costs of a data breach, um, and also to indemnify for, uh, for any third-party claims. Um, the timing of breach notification will inevitably be the sticking point as between uh, a data processor and a data controller, but um, there's, there's one thing that's clear, there's going to need to be fast notification uh, from a processor to a controller uh, if the processor uh, suffers the data breach. Um, I'll also note that processors are now directly liable under the GDPR. That was not true under the directive. Um, so they have to be, they're liable for their own security violations, but um, you know, this really is cold comfort because if a vendor suffers a compromise, uh, it's the data controller that uh, has the responsibility of notification. Next slide, please. Path to compliance, and I'll turn it over to Aaron. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so what do you do? How do you deal with this? Um, obviously, the first and most important piece um, to, to, the, to the path to compliance is having management buy-in prior to embarking on your compliance path. Um, this is really, really critical. Um, obviously, the GDPR, part of what it's trying to do is, is sort of promote data protection within organizations. When you look at the role of the data protection officer and the fact that it has to report to the highest levels of management, they're trying to say, look, guys, this is a really important issue. And so, you know, we, we've always felt that it was a really important issue. And I think, you know, when you start to look at the numbers involved with the GDPR, obviously, it's a really important issue and you need to get management buy-in. Um, you know, the GDPR is a combination of in evolving and completely new requirements, and so you can't treat this as a completely new law, or you shouldn't, because you'll start to spin some wheels. Um, in our view, there's sort of two general phases to, to comply with the GDPR. In, in the first phase is, is the diligence phase, and, and that's in, in part to understand the facts. You know, how do you collect data, who, what, when, where, why? Um, you know, what do you collect? How do you collect it? Who do you share it with? How do you secure it? How do you dispose of it? How long do you keep it? Those types of questions. But you also want to then understand your compliance infrastructure around data protection. For many of you, it's existed, right? And it's going to be very relevant to your GDPR compliance infrastructure. And so you take those pieces of information about your data flows and about your compliance infrastructure. You conduct a gap analysis against the requirements. And you develop a strategic remediation plan. There's only five and a half months left. It has to be strategic. You have to think about the lowest hanging fruit that's, you know, creating the most risk for your organization. And then you put a work plan together and then you execute that plan, keeping in mind that the deadline is May 25th of 2018 and that will often require you, you know, to work together across a number of disciplines, right, to make sure that you're able to implement these new operational requirements, whether that's with your marketing group, um, obviously, the legal groups involved, the information security group, <coughs> information technology. For many companies, there's a technology um, <coughs> application or many applications that are used in order to facilitate compliance. And so it's an, it's a, it's a, it's an interdisciplinary task, GDPR compliance. <coughs> and if you haven't gotten started, we would certainly encourage you to do that straight away. Okay. Nicole, I think you are on next. I think that's accurate, Lisa. So I'm here to talk about what uh, an effective cybersecurity incident response plan looks like uh, with respect to personally identifiable information. And I'd like to start really just with a, a quick survey question, a quick polling question for everybody to see. Um, w uh, and I'm not sure if this is up because it's not coming on my screen. Um, I think that we are having more technical difficulties, so I will skip the polling question and go to really operating in today's cyber landscape. Uh, we at Deloitte, we break it down into three different baskets. 
Secure, vigilant, resilient. Secure is pretty self-explanatory. It is putting all of those technical procedures and measures in place to make sure that the data is secure. That is where encryption would come in. That is where the pseudonymization would come in. Uh, putting everything together so that you are complying uh, with the recommendations of the GDPR. Vigilant is making sure that all of the security controls you put in place are actually working. You're looking out proactively for threats. You have threat intelligence going on, somebody's looking at the dark web to see if the data is out there, to make sure that you are protecting because if you are vigilant and you find something, you can go back and increase your security before you get to the point of resilient. Resilient uh, focuses on the life cycle of incident response. It's the ability to respond and the ability to recover. And within that comes the 72-hour notice that we see for the GDPR. Lisa mentioned cyber insurance. That would come into that, disaster recovery. But really, it's the crisis and data breach management that we're focusing on today. And if we, if we see the um, there's a cyber incident response life cycle, and it flows in a, in a variety of ways. It starts really with governance and strategy. And that, Aaron mentioned dotting your I's and crossing your T's. And what we're finding in GDPR, readiness and preparation, it goes back to governance and strategy. It makes sure that long before anything happens, you have all of your plans and your policies documented, and you've thought through these things. And part of the difference that we're seeing now between typical incident response and privacy data breach incident response is to accommodate the 72-hour requirements, there needs to be a marriage between those two different departments within an organization in a way that hasn't typically happened. Currently, privacy is, is involved in the, the triage phases, the respond, the recover phases of an incident response life cycle. Uh, after the incident has been detected, and people in the, uh, in the incident response team, the CERT team, have identified things that might not get you to the 72-hour requirement. The goal should be to get privacy involved earlier at those governance and strategy stages so they can identify or you can identify and let the authorities know, that the supervisory authorities know within the 72 hours, and then continue through the life cycle. Uh, responding, it's responding to the supervisory authorities, but it's also responding under the GDPR to consumers if their rights and liberties are, are at risk. Putting different policies and procedures in place to accommodate that are new frequently. You know, we are familiar with the ID theft and credit monitoring, but under the GDPR, there are requirements that you need to let people know directly and very quickly. So do you have somebody who is prepared to uh, to let those people know. How are you going to do it? Your policy should consider what types of notifications are out there, whether or not you want to do that online, whether or not you want to do that directly by mailing to people. How are you going to deal with your supply chain uh, if something happens and you need to notify people within 72 hours? Does your policy think about the fact that you know, who's going to let people know? Are your suppliers going to let their direct customers know that this has happened? What are you going to do internally? Uh, does somebody know internally how the communications channel looks? Uh, so that when you have either consumers or your own employees calling a hotline, can somebody answer those questions? And do you have that set up early? Because in 72 hours, you're not going to be able to all of a sudden find vendors. You're not going to all of a sudden be able to put together a phone hotline, a call tree. So in that preparedness and, and readiness step, we really find that it's important for people to think through all of these different considerations that really are brought up by this 72-hour requirement. You know, traditionally, here in the U.S., we've had closer to 30 days to respond under the, the state, the different state data breach notification requirements. There's a very big difference between three days and, and 30 days, and it does require the earlier um, incidents. So what we've seen generally, cyber incident response success has a variety of com components. 
And having your legal risk and compliance teams at the ready is essential. Uh, Pre-existing knowledge of the cyber incident, um, regulatory compliance issues, uh, where all of these things are going to go by your cyber risk and compliance people is essential. Having them involved at the beginning, not as an afterthought, is very important. Uh, what we find is the cyber response plans uh, simple and flexible uh, is a great idea, and um, it becomes difficult under a time crunch. So when you're talking about redoing your policies and your plans, you really need to balance that flexibility because no incidents are identical with the structure that you need to respond. Uh, technology that goes back to the vigilant uh, process, preparedness, Preparedness really we think of as Lisa mentioned the tabletops. We, we tend to do more aggressive war games here from our perspective. And that helps you build the muscle memory that enables a more effective and, and consistent response. And that shows in operations where the integration is between the different entities within your organization that may be involved in a cyber response. Uh, people what we find uh, don't always take ownership. People don't know who is, it, who is responsible. And when you're in a war game or a tabletop situation, it, it acts as education. Uh, it provides people with awareness of the risks and responsibilities. Uh, it identifies who is supposed to be on that core cyber response team. And it makes sure that the people on that team are the right people on the team um, and that they're able to handle the experience uh, of dealing with an incident or an event. Um, and if you put all of those together, that's really where we're seeing cyber incident response success. Um, we have been doing some wargaming events for clients who are, are either testing out their GDPR policies or, or trying to identify gaps within their existing policies that need to be filled in with respect to the GDPR. And some of the things that we've been finding and some of the concerns that clients have been facing are, have to do with incident misclassification. Going back to that idea that there's traditionally been 30 days, so the CERT team, the, the incident response team internally, may identify something as a technical error uh, and not classify it as a privacy problem immediately. And that can percolate through a system, uh, through a company, and it may take months sometimes uh, for that to be identified as a privacy problem. Uh, not acceptable when you're looking at a 72-hour requirement. So at that early stage, at that planning stage, the incident response technical people need to coordinate with the privacy teams to make sure that there, there's an educational process, there's an exchange of information process involved there so that privacy and data breach events are identified and brought to the right teams right away. As I said, who owns it? Uh, it's just not clear for a breach that implements EU data because you're not just coordinating with your U.S. teams who may all be in one place and able to get in a room together. All of a sudden, you're pulling in your international teams, your international leaders of, of privacy and data protection. You may be looking at multiple countries within the EU, in which case the one-stop shop concept is very good uh, that the GDPR offers. But which one stop do you go to? Uh, it, there's been some guidance by the Article 29 Working Party that suggests you want to go to the supervisory authority where there are the largest number of affected or impacted residents or individuals. So your investigation needs to consider where that aggregate set of information of people are. Say that's France. Do you have all of your policies ready all of your documents ready to release in French? Do you have them ready to be released in all of the different languages that are you know, involved in the EU? That's something that people haven't really thought of, having those predetermined press releases, the notifications prepared in the different languages. Uh, the policy updates obviously need to be done, increased coordination for the teams, and then just making sure that uh, everybody is involved in the process. And I'll stop here. I have a few more slides, but we are two minutes to the end. Um, so let's 
the, um, these are some of the reasons that cyber war games are, are used, and I think I've identified most of those. What I find really is in addition to getting feedback on the effectiveness of an existing response plan, because we're five months away from the GDPR going live, uh, doing a game now is a, sufficient, or is, a, is a really successful way to identify gaps in your current policy and give ideas on ways to improve the current IR plan to reflect the GDPR considerations. And um, these are just a variety of things, and we'll circulate these slides, but just things to consider, uh, some of the leading practices to think about when you are updating your GDPR incident response plan. The word awareness has, has been used. It's been used by the Article 29 Working Party. You need to document your files and know what awareness means for your incident within your company. Uh, you want to understand your obligations as a controller versus a processor. I believe Lisa mentioned she's got a, a client who has 20 thousand different processors. Well, the processor, if you look at the letter of the law, is the one who should be going to the supervisory authority. But if you're the company that has 20,000 or 20 or even 10 different processors, you really want to look at whether or not you should be the one as the controller who is organizing and orchestrating the response to the, um, to the different supervisory authorities. And that's something that if you're just looking at the letter of the law, you may not think of. But when you start thinking through it practically, um, that's something that you might want to be considering in the, in the contractual phases with people. Um, other things I think are, are fairly self-explanatory. You want to document uh, the, re the investigation that you're doing. You want to focus on the remediation. It is easy to get excited and focus just on how we're going to let everybody know, how we're going to meet the 72 hours. But part of the GDPR requirements are that you inform people of what the remediation steps are that you've taken. So you want to run that on a dual track and make sure that your policy accommodates that. So we are right at the top of the hour. I am going to stop there. Um, Nicole, there I'll, are just a it, I'll just take it from you and, uh, and wrap up our program. Thank you. Perfect. Um, th thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll follow up with a recording. Uh, please visit uh, Hunton & Williams' privacy blog at www.huntonprivacyblog.com uh, for information on the latest developments on the GDPR and also uh, for a copy of our guide for uh, in-house lawyers on the GDPR. Uh, we look forward to having you at future events. Thank you very much.